Hello and welcome to the Feeling Good Podcast. I am your host, Fabrice Nye, and joining me here in the Murrieta Studios is Dr. David Burns. Hi, David. Hi, Fabrice. Dr. David Burns has been a pioneer in the development of cognitive therapy, and he is the creator of the new team therapy. He is the author of Feeling Good, which has sold over 5 million copies in the United States and has been translated into over 20 languages. He is an emeritus adjunct clinical professor of psychiatry at the Stanford University School of Medicine. Welcome to episode 96 of the Feeling Good podcast. I'm very excited today because we are finally doing a live session on interpersonal issues. I've been waiting for this for months. So thank you, David and and Jill, for making that possible. Uh, What we have today is a live session with uh, Lee, a uh, student of uh, David's who lives in the UK, and he has some uh, uh, marital issues uh, with his wife. So for a heads up, this session was recorded uh, over a video conference, and uh, the the sound quality may have something to do with that, but it, it's, actually, it's actually pretty good. So I think that uh, this will be a, a really good uh, example. So what we, we decided to do, the session is about three hours. Uh, it's been broken down into three segments. The one that uh, we're broadcasting today is the empathy part. We'll do the agenda setting part next time. And then the, uh, the methods and the, the five secrets in the third part. What we will do is uh, we will make the entire session available in one shot, one big sound file that people can download and that we'll make available in the show notes in, uh, in the last episode. And, uh, and Jail, by the way, is uh, the director of the Feeling Good Institute. She's been working with... Uh, with David for many, many years. I mean, she's like the top star of the Team CBT model. Anything you'd like our listeners to know, Jill? No, thank you. That is overly kind of you. I, I am the director of training at the Feeling Good Institute. And now I'm, I'm just hoping to follow in David's footsteps and having a ball uh, teaching and training therapists with David on Tuesday evenings. Um, at Stanford, which is really lots of fun. And then I also um, do a lot of training online through the Feeling Good Institute. And our training at Stanford on Tuesday nights from 5 to 7.30 is open for free of charge for any interested Bay Area professionals. Or if you're a mental health professional from Nigeria or New York or wherever, and you're in the Bay Area, contact us. You'd be welcome to join us uh, in, at one of our uh, Tuesday night trainings at, at Stanford as well. And we, we, we teach together just this exactly the same as what you're, you've been hearing on, on the podcast. So without further ado, um, Jill and David, uh, welcome. So what we're having here is, uh, is the empathy part of uh, of the the session and uh, I want to say that uh, by the way I was not present when you did this recording so I only uh, listened to it afterwards I noticed that there's a really long empathy part I feel like it, it's longer than a lot of the the sessions you've done in the past you spent a whole hour listening to Lee's story you know you went over the mood survey he talked about his relationship Jill did a beautiful job of uh, reflecting back his uh, thoughts and feelings and so did David and then it went back and forth and Lee got really emotional with with uh, with uh, telling his story why would you say you you spent so much time on the empathy part and by the way you know you both got an A at the end but uh, it it uh, it took a while uh, to to get to the agenda setting so can you say something about this either Jill or David? There's a great, great answer for that, and uh, Jill will now give it. (laughs) (laughs) Uh Um, Yeah, absolutely, Fabrice. I mean, I think part of it is that Lee actually is just a very open and warm and, you know, very, was very happy and comfortable sharing a lot with us. Um, I also think the fact that his conflict with his wife, which is what he was really coming to us wanting to work on, 
brought up a lot of feelings related to his relation, related to other relationships, basically, which is not uncommon when we yeah. help people with relationship problems. And so he found himself not just sharing about his relationship with his wife and the history of that relationship, but telling us a lot about other relationship figures in his life, his relationship with his father and his mother, his relationship with his son from his first marriage. And I think he really was trying to share with us that so much of how he relates to his wife is related to experiences he's had in the past. And additionally, what we discovered was that, you know, the piece of work that we did with Lee around his relationship was really only one piece of work. And clearly he also was sharing with us that he has a lot of um, kind of his own thoughts and feelings that he could work on too, right? A lot of feelings of guilt and anger and frustration that could also be the focus of sort of a different therapy session. Yeah, you're actually focused on one very specific incident, which in a way we could look at as, oh, it's, it's not a big deal compared to, you know, the turmoil he's going on with, uh, that's going on with uh, his son and his ex-wife. But really, that one thing that you, you zoomed in on really helped him blossom and, and find how to, to really become closer to, to his current wife. Mm -hmm. And by the way, it'll, spoiler alert, at the end of uh, uh, the third episode, we will read uh, a letter that uh, Lee sent afterwards, which was just very heartwarming. One other thing I would comment on, on on empathy, there's a kind of a yin and a yang to it, two, two opposite sides. Clients or patients uh, need to tell their story and, and be listened to without any attempt to, to help them or correct them or, or, or cheer them up. Uh, the, the tears need to flow, which, which they did in this session. And the therapist needs to grasp the patient as a human being at, at as deep a level as, as possible to conceptualize wh what's going on so you're not just throwing techniques at, at the patient. Um, and, and Lee had a lot to say. Now, there's another side to the coin, however. I think that uh, if we hadn't brought the empathy portion to closure, Lee would have been found it very helpful and, and appealing to, to talk for much, much longer and talk about childhood and why am I like this and my relationship with my, my, with my father and, and with my ex and, and, and things like that. And, and human beings ha have just this powerful urge to do that. Therapists too. Yeah. Now, this might sound a little little cynical, and I apologize for that. Sometimes I'm probably a bit too cynical, but I think in clinical practice, if you have a full fee patient who wants to come in and talk and talk and talk, that type of dialogue that we were doing in the first hour could, could really go on for months, even, even years, and everyone would be thinking, the patient would be thinking that this is what psychotherapy should be, and the therapist would be fancying that they're doing something deep and wonderful. But what's really happening is, is, is that there isn't any change going on in, in the person's life. But again, if it's private practice, if it's self-pay, if it's full fee, the, the therapist is kind of being pay, paid off to just, you know, listen, and, and, and it's, it's pretty easy. Now, when when we're working with Lee, uh, we're we're not getting paid. Uh, that there's no no motive here except to to do some good work and and to sh share that share that with other people. Um, uh, but um, I, I I think that, uh, that 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 you have to have a focus in the here and now on one specific moment when the patient was upset, and show the patient how to change in this case, his life at that one moment, uh, and, and that you could, you know, talk, talk for years about your past, your, your childhood, without coming to the time when, when you have to actually change your life, change the way you're, you're relating to other people. Yeah, you know, uh, toward the, the end of the, the empathy uh, segment, 
Uh, Lee says, and I, I, I took a note, he said, I feel like the loneliest person in the world. I remember that, yeah. And, and from a statement, I mean, he was very tearful that, at that time. Yeah. And from a statement like this, you could go on, oh, tell me about that. And you could really delve into the depth of, of, uh, of pain that he's experiencing. Yes, and in addition, the therapist could fancy himself or herself as providing that corrective emotional experience that's yeah. what we were told to do when i was yeah. a psychiatric resident and, and you think oh i'm being so wonderful i'm the friend he never had this right. is gonna this is gonna I'll save you from your loneliness yeah, yeah exactly and and i guess what we're saying is is that in, in our opinion for what it's worth and we're not always right but that that would be a a huge error mm -hmm. but but to stop doing that the therapist has to change before you can ask your patient to change and the therapist has to let go of your own narcissism your own codependency your own compulsive urge to rush in and 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 save or rescue the patient it's not that we don't want to help the patient we we do want to and compassion is vitally important but uh uh, the, the 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 endless uh, talking and, and support I think has has limited limited effectiveness. Now people from many schools of therapy would probably radically object to to what I'm saying and what what Jill is saying and, and think that that long talking 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 is is good. And I'll make one last quick point. But I, I gave a talk years ago at a psychoanalytic conference in San Francisco, and I was emphasizing how we're trying to bring about rapid change. In this case, we're trying to do it in one session with Lee to bring about real tangible changes today, measurable, huge changes in his, in his, in his life. But, um, and that was the theme that I was talking at this conference, but one of the psychoanalysts there whispered in my ear uh, d during one of the panel discussions that uh, most of her patients had been with her for more than 10 years. And just a few of them were starting to make little tiny baby steps of change right, right, right now. And what, what she was telling me essentially was she was proud of the fact that she had this long, long-term talking relationship with people. And she thought that was the pure gold of psychotherapy and that she thought any focus on rapid change was kind of like a fool's gold. She, she told me that kind of as, as a put down, uh, you, you might say. Yeah. Well, you know, if uh, efficiency is not your primary focus, uh, why not, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I'd say uh, let's, let's go ahead and listen to this uh, empathy segment, unless there's something else that you'd like to add. Uh, I want to introduce two, two very special people. Um, first of all, Lee Davey. Uh, who's uh, kindly agreed to join us from from London, and my very dear colleague, Dr. Jill Jill Levitt. Um, Fabrice has been asking for some time that could could we do a, the interpersonal model on a on a podcast for the Feeling Good podcast, and Lee kindly consented to. Uh, tell us about an issue, a marital issue that he's having, and give us a beautiful opportunity to, to do the, uh, the interpersonal component of, of team therapy. But before we dive in, tell us a little bit about your online work, Lee, uh, helping people with addictions, and tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we'll dive right into our, our, our clinical role. Okay, my name's Lee Davy. I'm 43 years of age. I left school at 16 with zero qualifications. Uh, joined the railway, British railway system back then. And for the next 19 years, that's where I worked up to the age of around 35. And around that time, I was married. I've been married for 15 years at that time. I had a nine-year-old boy and alcohol had completely and utterly taken control of my life. And... I was really struggling to keep that relationship together. And I was sure that the way to uh, fix it was to stop drinking and that would save my marriage. So I stopped drinking and then my ex-wife filed for divorce. So that actually didn't work out as planned. Um, but in the wake of the divorce, I realized that a oh, strange thing happens when you go through a divorce, David, you get, it's one of the worst 
feelings of suffering that you could go through and loss, uh, particularly when you lose your son because you, you have to give the son up to live with, your, with, your, with his mother. Um, but there's also a kind of liberation, liberating feeling to it because uh, your responsibilities change. And uh, it, it allowed me to have a really good focus on my life. And I decided to quit working on the railway and um, decide to spend my rest of my years helping people to stop drinking alcohol, which I had done at that time. And that was around 2009. And uh, in various different arc incarnations, I've been doing that and living a very, very different life to the one that I used to live. And I would say in the last probably 12 months, the Truth About Alcohol website and training course and the uh, Stride Community Forum has really taken off. We also have the Alcohol Addiction Podcast. That's been going for a little bit longer, 130 guests uh, at, at this time. And our training course is doing really well. I, I believe that the the, uh, the global average of uh, actually completing a training course is, is only 5% online training course. And ours is 44%. And six months in, six months after people have taken a training course at the moment, 66% of people are still not drinking. So uh, we're doing some good work over there. And um, yeah, and, and, and things like this, being very open and honest uh, about the struggles that we're going through is pretty key to that. So I see this not only as helping me, but it can really help other people as well. Well, that sounds great, uh, Lee. If uh, and then we'll we'll dive in here. But if if uh, some of our listeners would like to connect with either your Truth About Alcohol uh, training program or uh, your Alcohol Addiction podcast, where what's the uh, web address? What what should they they go to? If they uh, Google www.thetruthaboutalcohol.co.uk, uh, they would find everything they need there. They can email me direct at thetruthaboutalcohol at gmail.com. And if you Google the Alcohol, Alcohol and Addiction podcast uh, by Lee Davey, you'll, you'll pop up there and you'll see it on SoundCloud, iTunes, and all the other different bits and bobs around the world that you can find. Podcasts. So let me just uh, repeat that web address. It would, this is all one word, the truth about alcohol. Yeah, dot co dot uk. Dot co dot uk. Dot uk. Great, yeah. perfect. Well, um, let should we go ahead and dive in, Jill? Yeah, let's do that. And should we start out with uh, T equals uh, testing? That sounds like a good idea. Okay, I. Let me just grab your brief mood survey, which is in my printer. I've been getting all this stuff organized. I'll be back in about uh, three seconds. Okay. Last time I had David on my podcast, he didn't run away. <laughs> cat, 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 cat. Here I am back, and uh, I, I asked Lee to fill out the brief mood survey uh, before today's session, and uh, Jill and I and all of the team CBT therapists do this with every client we see at every at every session. And your score, uh, and we we'll do it at the beginning and end, so we can see if there have been any changes. And then we'll also ask Lee to rate us on empathy and helpfulness and other other dimensions and your uh, depression score is zero now that's that's extremely important that can go from zero to 20 and sometimes you'll have a very happy looking person who has like an 18 which is horrifically severe uh, and in this case the zero means no depression at all so we know that today's session won't be focused on on mood problems no suicidal uh, uh, urges or thoughts uh, either. Now the anxiety is uh, is a little bit elevated, seven uh, out of 20, and, and the ones that were uh, the most elevated is uh, feeling moderately anxious, worrying about things moderately, uh, tens tense or on edge moderately, and, and just uh, slightly nervous. The anger is three out of 20, it's, it's just a, it's a low score, it indicates not a great deal of anger. Uh, sometimes the anger will increase during a session, somebody's having a marital conflict or conflict with someone and as, they, as you begin to get into it, you, you find out they're, they're you know, angrier than they, than they acknowledged at the beginning. Uh, 
the session, but uh, the, the only three, the, the only ones he had elevated scores is just slightly frustrated, slightly annoyed, and uh, slightly irritated. And then on the positive feelings scale, which can go from zero to 40, you have a 35. But all of the items were in the extreme range, which means really a lot of uh, happiness and uh, feeling worthwhile and feeling good about yourself and feeling productive and uh, feeling, uh, you know, encouraged and optimistic and, and, and hopeful. The only two that were not high was I feel close to people. And that's only moderately. That can be not at all, somewhat moderately a lot or extremely. So you're not feeling as close to people as you would like. And then I feel a connection to others. That's only somewhat, you know, again, not at all, somewhat moderately a lot or extremely. So there's some low scores there. And then on the uh, marital satisfaction scale or relationship satisfaction scale can go from zero to 30. Zero is the most lowest score possible in indicating extreme dissatisfaction. And uh, 30 would be a perfect score, indicating just the happiest marriage Im uh, imaginable. And your score was 17, which is which is pretty low. Uh, th th there were two highish ratings: uh, communication and openness, and overall satisfaction. It was was moderately satisfied. The highest rating would be very satisfied. Uh, on uh, intimacy and closeness, you're moderately dissatisfied. Uh, on a degree of affection and caring, you're somewhat dissatisfied. And uh, resolving conflicts and arguments, only somewhat satisfied. So there's a lot of room for, for improvement there. Uh, so why don't you tell us, uh, well, what, what, now we're doing this, uh, new fangled team therapy, T-E-A-M. So we did the T equals testing, and then what's the E stand for? Empathy. Oh, that's right, empathy. <laughs> so why don't you uh, <laughs> right, gotcha. why don't you tell us a, a little bit about what's been going on in, in, in your relationship, and uh, Jill and I will uh, see if we can empathize. And, and during the empathy phase, we're going to just let you tell your story. We're going to try to provide some warmth and support and, and acceptance. Uh, we're, we're not going to jump in and try to help you or rescue you or give you any advice or, or anything like that and we'll we'll see if we can get an a an a on empathy and then uh w once we we all feel that uh, jill and david did a, a a good job uh and 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 they got their a then we'll go on to agenda setting or paradoxical agenda setting finding out what if anything you want help with and also bringing any resistance to change to, to, to conscious awareness and then seeing if we can if we can melt that away. So I want to just formally thank you, Lee, for making yourself uh, vulnerable and uh, and available. The, the, the live work is always the uh, the best teaching and the most inspiring. Uh, I always love you know doing co-therapy or teaching with, with you, Jill. It provides such a, a rich and warm experience, and your skills are just uh, just incredible. So let's dive in here and, and, and see what happens. I might also say that uh, relationship problems can sometimes be the toughest area of, of, of treatment. D depression and anxiety, people can often recover, you know, with amazing speed. But uh, the the area of resistance is much stronger in uh, interpersonal interpersonal issues. We'll we'll see how that plays out to, today. So why don't why don't you dive in and Jill, you you dive in and I'll kind of take some notes. I mean it. I mean this actually kind of sums up my relationship. I guess is I I filled out that uh, brief mood survey in the wake of having a, uh, an argument last night which has been actually unusual recently. But before we filmed, I had to go and say to my wife, Liza, uh, what, what did we argue about last night? And, and that really sums it up, is we've got into a, a state now where we've, we've completely lost root cause. We, we've, we've, we get ourselves 
down so many dark alleys and we can't find our way back to what on earth we were even arguing about in the first place. And I, I'm definitely have to take responsibility for that. I, I, I firmly believe that my wife is an excellent communicator, much better, well-trained than I am. And I, I, I find that I just, I just put problems on problems. I see things that don't exist. I mind read uh, terribly. I have this deep resentment there, I feel, from my wife towards me. And we've both kind of lost a little bit of respect, particularly when we're talking to each other in conflict situation. And as we have an 18-month-old daughter around the house, and we are very, very aware that how we behave and the values that we extol and, and play out in our life is going to be paramount to the values that she kind of grows up her foundational system. So, you know, we don't want to be shouting at each other or talking to each other or even having uh, negative facial expressions. We want to be loving and connecting. And, uh, you know, last night's fight, David and Jill, it, it basically came down to, I sometimes ac I, I, I accuse my wife of passive aggressiveness. So, uh, meta messages. I, I always believe there's a deeper meaning behind what she's saying. So she'll say something like, um, here, here, Lee, why don't you have your daughter for an hour? Um, and then to me, I, uh, that goes into my head as you have your daughter for an hour. And that goes in my head and comes out as, um, Hey, um, you've done nothing all day today with your, with your child. I'm completely overwhelmed with her. You're the worst uh, father in the world. Pull your finger out your ass and take care of your kid. And because it, because it happens Can like that. Can we just repeat that, that list there? I want to write that down. <laughs> you, you, you've done uh, nothing uh, all day long. I've done nothing all day long. I am the worst father in the world. And my wife has obviously had to take care of her all day and it's time that I pull my finger out of my ass. And, you know, Liza even said to me yesterday, Lee, I've got to be honest, you know, you've promised me that Fridays and Saturdays will always be our time and you go missing. You, it almost feels like you're running away from us. And um, there is some truth in that. But not because I'm running away because I feel, you know, I feel overwhelmed as a responsibility as a father, but I, I don't seem to be able to switch off from work mode because I'm, I, you know, I'm, I've got my own business and I'm like running it myself to being dad and husband. I just seem to be a little bit vacant. I don't deal well with not, not having a structure on a Friday and Saturday. So I'm, I'm always trying to plan for me to, to do something. I don't know, like I need to go pick a car up and then I'll disappear or I need to do this or I need to do that and I'm disappearing. And Liza is taking that as um, that I, you know, don't want to be around them. And also, and then I'll shut up. Um, Liza said, when Liza says to me, for example, that she's doing all the child minding that – um, she doesn't get a break on the weekends when she really needs me to step up. I cannot, I cannot escape from the thought of, well, lucky you that you get to take care of our child all week. I'm working 16 hours a day and you want me to take care of our child on the weekend to give you a break. When do I have a break? When do I ever do anything for myself? The Champions League final is on today. I want to watch it, but I know I can't. You know, I want to watch Han Solo in the cinema. I know I can't. And then you're going on to me that you don't have five minutes to go to the toilet or have a shower. And then, and then I, I, I cannot stop that resentment coming out in either sarcasm, passive aggressiveness, sometimes just direct <coughs> anger. Um, yeah, I think that's enough to start with at the moment. Okay, so Lee, let me see if I can, um, you know, offer you some empathy, but really also just uh, kind of walk through your story and see if I understand you correctly. You did share a lot with us, and I do um, 
already, you know, feel a great deal of caring for you, just sort of hearing your story and, and experiencing sort of your openness to share all of this with us. Um, and it sounds like you are struggling, even though on the testing measure, you're not experiencing symptoms of depression. Um, you know, the relationship satisfaction score was like 17 out of 30. And you're sharing with us that you feel like you've gotten into, uh, you said we, we get down dark alleys. So it sounds like you and your wife seem to be um, arguing a lot. You kind of find yourself arguing. Um, you did a, you, you shared with us actually in the beginning that you feel like you take a lot of responsibility for that, um, that you feel like you can get really caught up in arguing and, um, and not being respectful. And you also said that you have the sense that you sometimes see things that don't exist, almost like you, you, see, you think that you're reading a lot into things. So it's very hard. You're interacting with her. She says something and then kind of your mind is off and you um, are experiencing her as being resentful of you, as kind of thinking that you're not doing enough. Um, and it sounds like then you'll probably, I'm guessing you'll respond really defensively then. Um, sounds like yeah. probably sometimes she is upset with you. And then other times she says things where she may not even be upset with you and you experience her as being upset with you. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then you also shared that you have a really strong um, drive or desire to work on your relationship with your wife, not only because you would like to feel closer to your wife and have more sort of peace between the two of you, but because you'd really like to be able to model positive communication and respectful communication in front of your 18, 18 month old daughter. Right. Yeah. That, that, that's another one uh, where I'm always listening to relationship podcasts. I'm always doing the work. I'm always reading books and then we'll get into a fight and she'll, uh, uh, she'll accuse me of not, of never changing. And I'm like, and then, and then this story comes up, right? Are you kidding me? There cannot be a human. There cannot be a man on this planet trying as hard as I am to be a better husband. And you just, you just keep telling me I'm shit. And then every time I then hear, "Wow, you're an amazing husband," or "I really love you," or "You're a spectacular father," I just doesn't, just doesn't sink in. Like it, it, it's, it's never going to be there. My, I seem to carry this. I am a terrible father, and I'm a terrible husband. Just just is there. It just doesn't seem to go anywhere. That sounds so painfully. I mean, it sounds like there's, there's a number of things going on. There's the kind of arguing and the habit of continuing to argue, but there's also some sense that you carry around with you that you're a terrible father. And there are times where it sounds like you're doing things or saying things that might actually be kind of triggering that in her. And so she is saying like, man, with all this self-help you're doing, why aren't you better? Right. Um, but then there's also on top of that, even times where she's sharing with you that you're a lovely father, that you're doing such a great job and you don't even hear that because you're still feeling that you're not doing enough, that you're not a good enough father. I, I hear it, but it doesn't, um, it, it just doesn't really break through that barrier, you know, that force field that's there. And, um, I think e e even when I tell myself, like I, I'll reach a point where I'll say, right, that's enough. I, I am not telling myself I'm a bad father anymore. I'm not a bad father. I'm an excellent father. I'm an excellent husband. I'm not going down that road anymore. <sighs> I still don't believe it as much as I should be. It's, it's still, I'm just seem to be just saying it. I'm finding it difficult, particularly around the parents in it. And, 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 I'm, and I know that's likely because I've had a divorce and I, I have some tough choices to make because I, my son lives with his mom. Um, I know all that. I just don't seem to be able to get past it. Um, a little <clears throat> information that, can I share some of the information you sent us before the session? Yeah, sure. Um, you'd uh, sent a really, um, a very open, open comment about some of the conflicts in your relationships. And I'm, very much with Jill and a grateful uh, to you for talking to us today and, and being so, so open. Uh, you know, a lot of us, a lot of human beings are, are struggling with family issues and relationship issues and kind of 
keeping it hidden. And we get this idea sometimes that I'm the only one who's who's struggling with intimacy, with, with love, with, with family issues. And just as in your work in alcohol, it's so important for for people to open up and, and be honest and share in their recovery from alcohol abuse. It's it's just so crucial in life in, in general. The, for when when people are open, it just touches touches so many sending so many people listening right now can say wow i'm i've got the same thing in my relationships and but you you wrote and said lisa and i have been together for seven years now and we're married and have an 18 month old daughter uh, zia and then you have a 17 year old son and now 17 from from your previous marriage but you're saying in the past few years uh, that you become increasingly confrontational toward Lisa, your wife, over your perception that she's always telling me what to do. The birth of our daughter has compounded the issue, and now I, I believe she's trying to tell me how to parent. And just as an aside, one of the themes and what you were saying before is a lot of criticism going back and forth and, and then, uh, you know, feeling hurt and and getting getting defensive and the same thing we see here you say I react very petulantly by giving up and telling her that I will take a passive role in the relationship and just take orders from her to avoid conflict I I find myself questioning most of my decisions particularly around our daughter Zia with the question will Lisa approve of this so you're you're feeling that she's trying to control you and constantly uh, looking at what you're doing and and being critical of that um, and to make things even more annoying, Lisa used to complain to me that her, her mother used to, to control her. So you're thinking that she has a controlling tendency, and it's so common when we're having a relationship problem is to look at to the other person for the cause of, of, of the problem. So in this sense, you're telling yourself, oh, she's too controlling because her mother used to control her I had David I, I actually put that one in there because because of the lack of empathy so it, for me it's like how can you not understand your controlling when you complain to me that your mother's doing exactly the same thing that so I put it in as like I just it flabbergasted me that there's zero empathy there because the response is I don't control you and then and then it's like <laughs> my mom controls me it, yeah that, that baffles me yeah what what just happened uh, Jill Oh, uh, I get Lee is uh, feeling angry with his wife and, <laughs> and yeah, telling, saying he can't possibly understand how controlling, how she can't empathize with him. Yeah, right. Yeah. And you were saying that when you raise this, uh, she dismisses that. And perhaps you felt that I was just dismissing it too. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure this is a real issue between the two of you. And Lisa has never fully acknowledged her role in this debate and simply believes I need to, to, to man up. And, uh, and again, this is such a common problem in relationship problems. It's pretty much universal that we're telling ourselves it's, it's the other person's fault. There, there's something that she's doing wrong that, that, that she doesn't see or she won't acknowledge. And could I go over this relationship journal at this point, Jill? Sure. Um, I wonder if I could just make one quick Yeah, please jump in. Too. Um, so, Lee, actually, because I, I heard, so David and I received that email from you, and then what I heard in your description now is, is more of the same but a little different, and what I heard now is actually, and really my heart goes out to you around this, is that it almost like you vacillate between – kind of blaming yourself and feeling kind of guilty and less than and like I'm really not measuring up and maybe I really am being selfish and maybe I do work too much and I'm not taking enough care and spending enough time and being attentive enough. There's sort of that which is like self-blame and really feeling kind of guilty and responsible to the other side which is like she's too demanding, she expects too much of me, she doesn't understand. Um, 
And, you know, and, and here, here you are, Lee, working so hard during the week, right? And then she's expecting you to, to provide her with a break over the weekend, kind of like, when do you get a break? Um, so anyway, the, the, I'm hearing both sides of it, both that there are pieces, there are times where you sort of blame yourself and feel really down on yourself and self-critical. And then there are other times where you're sort of like, you know, she's got to figure her stuff out. She's, she's really making things difficult for me and feeling angry and blaming her. Is it, am I getting that right? Yeah, that the, the latter comes out when I'm in conflict mode a lot of the time or when I'm trying to defend myself or defend my honor or wh whatever you want to say. Yeah. So that's definitely true. Something else I think that is, might be really important for you to know to help me. Um, I'm actually going through a year where I have to face my fear. So every time I'm afraid of something, I have to do it, right? And I've been doing that now for 31 days. And one of the things that I had, had to do yesterday was throw away everything that I've been holding on to for so long. Things like poems, love letters, I had memory jars, <clears throat> um, old, old diaries, uh, my... I'm a writer, so I like my first publications where I so anything that I it just what I you could put in this crap, <laughs> sentimental crap. And I was reading through old training records that I had in 2009 at the time when I was leaving the railway, I was going to give up drinking because I was going through my divorce. And the coach at the time that was working with me, and I, I don't even remember this until uh, yesterday when I read it said, what is the one thing that you want to change in your life? And I said, I want to be a better husband and I want to be a better father. I said, I'm not around my son. It's causing issues with my wife. I know I need to be with him more. Um, and I was blown away that I read that yesterday <clears throat> because I was like, wow, that hasn't changed in the last seven years, in particular for my boy. But am I now going through the same pattern with my daughter? And if I am, what is that pattern? Like, what is it? Am I, and I have a far, and I have a father. Well, my father's situation is my dad, my biological father left before I was born. So I've never even met him. Um, and which is not the most loving uh, act in the world. And my, my dad, who I've known all my life, it hasn't got a single loving bone in his body. Mm. You know, when my dad was home, he worked away a lot. When my dad was home, like he's the boss and everyone in the family, including my mom, I think just wanted him gone. Like just, just mm. go and work away again. Like get out of here so we can get on and enjoy our life. Not physically abusive, but the type of guy would come in while you're watching football and turn it off and say oh. something like, I'm not watching this crap. And then put some rubbish on that he's not even interested in. Never told me, love me, never kissed me, never hugged me. Um, so, you know, I can't help then thinking, is that something to do with it? which just seems so cliched, but that came up for me yesterday. I don't know if that's helpful for you at all. But. Sure. And then I know, David, you wanted to also look specifically at the relationship journal that Lee sent too. Um, but yeah, Lee, it sounds like you're saying that, again, there's this piece of wanting to be a better father um, and noticing that you'd, you were reading over some things you had written seven years ago, right? When you were working with a coach and the same theme was coming up of, of, I want to be there for my child. I want to be there for my wife. I don't know if I'm doing enough. Um, yeah. And then you shared with us, you know, that, that you don't feel like you have a good model of, you know, a father, neither your, your biological father who was never there. And then your dad who raised you, who really wasn't loving and attentive and was kind of dismissive and um, wasn't really there for you. I, I don't, I don't have a good, I don't have a good model in that respect. Uh -huh. How, however, I, I have to take 100% responsibility that I'm 43 and I realize that and I, yeah. and I've realized that for a very long time. I just have some, and I'm, I'm sure every human being is the same. I have some very, very strong, fundamental emotions, reactions, values, call it what you want, that just happen like this. Mm. Um, and um, particularly because I'm English and I'm now married to an American, Californian from Los Angeles, and we have a daughter together and I raised one daughter one way in a, in a completely different life when I was just a, a drunken little 
I don't know. Like I was just in a cocoon back then. Yeah. And now I'm like, it's different. I just, I'm just finding, yeah, I'm just, I just find, I just, <laughs> I just never feel like I'm doing anything right. It always seems like everything I'm doing is wrong. Like, you know, so, and I then, I then then become uh, emasculated. Is that the right word? You know? Yeah, it sounds like, Lee, you know, you've come to us wanting to work on your relationship with your wife and, um, and that, that will bring us to some communication tools and some ways of looking at the way the two of you are interacting, but you're also sharing with us that you bring kind of a lot of baggage to the situation, right? A lot of your own thoughts and feelings from your childhood and a lot of your own thoughts and feelings about wondering if you're good enough that probably really trigger you in the context of your relationship with your wife, right? It's hard when you're in the moment with your wife, it does sound like she might say something and it sets you off because you're probably already feeling kind of insecure and unsure of yourself or even a little bit down on yourself. And I, I know myself when I'm feeling um, kind of insecure about something and someone criticizes me for it, it's the hardest thing for me to accept that criticism or to like really be present to their feelings in the moment. Cause I've got so many of my own, like when someone attacks me and I feel insecure, someone attacks me and I feel confident, I feel like I can really kind of hear what they're saying because I don't have any ego in the way, you know, yeah. but when someone attacks me and I'm already feeling kind of insecure, I probably put up my armor and defend myself because I feel like I've, you know, I, because, because I feel so insecure myself. And I'm just sort of hearing that, that some of that might be happening for you, that when your yeah. wife kind of pokes at something that's already feeling uh, not good for you, that it's really hard to respond in kind of a loving and present, like to really just hear what she's saying, you kind of automatically put up your dukes and start fighting. It's, I call it, it's like, it's like the, I call it like the woodpecker approach. I, it will be, I'll wake up in the morning and uh, Liza might say, um, did you leave the fridge door open again? And then sh she'll say, um, go and dress Zia and I'll dress her. And she'll say, what are you putting her in that for? Uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll make her a drink of water and I've not used filtered water. And then I'll, I'll make her eggs and it'll be like, are those the organic ones? I'm like, no. And then it will be, um, I dropped something on the floor and I fed and then at the end of 15 or 20 of them, I just erupt and I have a real serious anger issue. I erupt. Uh. And then light is like, what is your problem? Like, all I just said was pick that cup up. And I'm like, no, you didn't just say pick the cup up. You've just been going on at me all day. And then yeah. she'll, she'll say, I haven't. What are you on about? There's something wrong with you. And then I start thinking I'm going loopy. And then <laughs> honestly, there were times in the past where I've, I've, I've been like this. Right, I'm going to write all this down. I've got to have a journal. I'm going to put the time, or I'm going to record it and then play it back. That is lunacy, right? That that is the ultimate "I need to be right" mentality, which I don't want in my life. Oh, you want it? You wanted to write it down and record it so you could show yes. it. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, oh I see. That, I thought you meant you wanted to write down like what you said so you could work on yourself, but oh, you meant oh. you wanted to like document all of her pestering. So you could say, see, you really have been controlling me all morning. I have an, I have a, <laughs> it's almost a biological need to prove that you're right all the time. Right. Got which, it. which, which now has reached a, a, a tipping point now, whereas last night when we had a fight, for example, every time I'm trying to communicate now, Liza will say, you just, you're just doing it again. You, you're trying to prove that you're right. Yeah. And so I can't get past it. I just have a couple of things to, to throw in here. I think you're do, both doing really, um, really beautifully. Um, the, uh, it, it sounds like you have two uh, objections, two, two problems with your interaction with your wife. One, she tries to control you, and one, she constantly, uh, constantly criticizes you. Um, and and then in response to her criticisms, you you kind of ignore them for a while until until you finally erupt, and then she's taken by by surprise, and and uh, you're you're probably mad at yourself. You say I have this anger issue. I shouldn't erupt, but then you're also angry at her for not being more aware of how she's triggering you by constantly criticizing you, constantly controlling you, and then. <clears throat> not 
admitting that she's doing these these things and that, that you have this this tremendous feeling that you want to prove that you're that, that you're right um, another theme that we didn't really summarize that you mentioned early on that I thought was really important is that you're both really overwhelmed by all the work you're doing in your lives <clears throat> and that like like on weekends you're you're wanting to unwind a little and, and do do some things to get rest and relaxation and then but she's feeling the same way and and so she she's saying things like uh, you, 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 you said um, <clears throat> Lee why don't you have your daughter for an hour which is a, a, a real <clears throat> kind of kind of put down and and then you you feel like she's telling you you you've done nothing all day long you're you're the worst father in the world uh, I took care of her, her all day and so that there's this kind of battle going on between the two of you for uh, peace and which you know a chance to to have a break and to, to have some some time off and you mentioned that you're working you know as it is 15 hours a day on on, on your business on your addiction programs and on, on your self-help self-help work as well um, and and it sounds like uh, that you are you know very very angry about being cr criticized and <clears throat> and being controlled and kind of blaming her and thinking you're right and she's she's wrong and then other times you know really questioning yourself and saying maybe I'm I'm not a good father and and feeling like you didn't have a good model growing up for for warm loving relationships and your own dad disappeared and the father who raised you was uh, uh, abusive and never gave you a hug or a kiss or, or 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 feelings of warmth and so you're you're almost trying to teach yourself how, how to have intimate relationships and how to be loving and and it sounds like you're you're very very disturbed that this pattern is emerging in your relationship and while on the one hand you're you know seeing your wife as as the cause of it then you look back in your own sentimental things from uh, seven years ago and saw even then how you were telling yourself you weren't a, a good enough father with, with, with your son who's, who's now 17 and now you're fearful because you're afraid you know the same thing might be emerging uh, both perhaps in your marriage uh, dr drifting further apart and, and also in your relationship with your, your beautiful and wonderful daughter. I don't know, is, is that right? Yeah, I mean, what come up for me there was um, I feel very intimate and connected with my children. Um, I'm very loving, very friendly. I'm always playing, always creative, uh, particularly with my daughter because obviously I, I'm, a, I'm in a different situation. So because I work, I work, you know, I work from home effectively or in coffee shops. So I get to see her more than I did when my boy was growing up. Um, I don't, I don't have that same intimacy and connection with Liza. Um, I, I know that that is to be expected when someone's just had an 18-month-old child and she's living in a, in a different country, uh, you know, the other side of the ocean away from her family. She's very lonely. Uh, she, it must be maddening at times as well as loving to spend your entire day, day in, day out with a, um, this little thing that just wants to be on your boob all day and um, and just, you know, having that dialogue with an 18-month-old and, and, and entertaining an 18-month-old must mean that it must be really, really difficult. And, yeah, and, and on top of that, I, I, I don't get to see my son as much and, I, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm spending six months in America, six months here, so that's really difficult. So, yeah, I don't think my... Your son is in America? No, I, I'm just about to go to America for six months. And I've been in America for six months. So I'm, I'm kind He's of spending... Spend Lee is spending six months in America and six months in England. So. Yeah. so I can be near my son and my family can spend time with Zia. And then Liza can spend time with her family. The whole thing is an absolute... Complicated. Mess. 
Yeah. Oh, I see. So you're in America right now? No, no, I'm in, I'm in the UK now. I'm going to America in November. Oh, okay. So you're in the UK with, with your wife, okay. who's separated for, from her family in California. And then your ex-wife is in America? No, no, no. So I'm in, I'm in the UK. Sorry. I'm in the UK with my Californian wife, who is separated from right. her family. Right. And I have a 17-year-old boy who I'm here for, who lives with his mom down the road. Oh, yeah. Who, all, who tries everything she can in her power to make life difficult for me to see him. Obviously, that's been changing a lot as he's got older because he can make more of his decisions. But there's such a strong tie there that he doesn't want to upset his mom. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I, I had to work away a lot during the divorce. And, and, and I had strict rules where I could only see my son um, twice a fortnight. Now, now, if anybody has ever been a parent and now all of a sudden you split up because, you know, nobody's done anything wrong, you've just grown apart, and now you can only see your child twice in a fortnight, like, that is horrific. And then, if you're away that fortnight that you're supposed to see him because you're working in Spain or whatever like it was, and you call and say, can I just change it because I'm flying out, and she says no, then now you don't get to see your son for like a month. And then you see your son and you're trying to cram all this like father in in one day. And your boy's just like, dad, I don't want you to be a dad. I just want you to play with me. And then, uh, as you can tell from my survey beforehand, I'm, I'm very good at just, just getting on with it. You know, I'm just, I'm good at just getting on with it. Like, and just going, okay, this is what it is. But there are times when I find myself just headbutting the wall. Like I have an ex-wife that I cannot please. I have a boy I cannot please. I have a wife now that I can't please. I have a kid that I can't please. Like, and I'm just trying my best to like help as many people as I can. And I just, the feedback I'm getting is great. Like people are like, oh, Lee, I changed my life, all this kind of stuff. But none of that seems to matter like right now, like, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to just stay here in this place that I hate because my son lives here and then beg him for attention to come and see me? Like, which is even getting more complicated now that he's 17. He's got a part-time job. He's got his A-levels. It, it's, it's like, dude, when can I see you next? Well, the thing is that I'm really busy right now at the moment, you know? And then the only times I can see him are going to be a Friday and a Saturday. Guess who? Guess what happens on a Friday and Saturday? They're the only times I get to spend with my wife and my daughter who are telling me that I don't spend enough time with them. So then I cannot be honest and open with anybody because I'm, I'm going to upset everybody at the same time. I cannot be open with my son because he will then hate my wife. I cannot be open with my wife because she'll be resentful for my son. So... I know I've just gone on a huge rant there <laughs> in those three, four minutes. Um, it's hugely complicated, I know, for everybody involved in this. I don't want to sound like a martyr, like for my, my ex-wife, my son, my, my wife, my daughter. Not, not my daughter because she's oblivious to all of this, but those three people have gone through tremendous pain and suffering. It isn't just me. Um, it's just... It's really difficult. Sounds like you might be oscillating between some resentment <clears throat> and and then uh, f feelings feelings of failure uh, that that you feel that you you can't please your ex, your son, your daughter, and your wife, and and it seems kind of un, unfair <clears throat> because you're trying to help people. <clears throat> you you have to beg your son to hang out with them. Uh, you can only do that on Fridays and Saturdays, and, and that's the time that you're supposed to have for your, your wife and daughter. And so you kind of feel like you're between a rock and a hard place. You're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. But then you're not allowed to express your feelings either, because then then people will be, uh, you know, they'll get re resent, resentful and, uh, you know, get get upset with you. Well, it's old. Uh, it's old as well, isn't it? It's like everybody even if i do talk about it it's like oh here lee goes with the same old story again 
when is this ever going to end? Like, when's he going to get over this? Uh, I don't know. Probably never. Like, the time of him being a nine-year-old to like being seventeen, he just goes like that, and you and you tell yourself every day, "I need to be with him. I need to spend more time with him." But then you don't because you can't because you can't just not work today and go and see your kid. It just, it's just. Knowing what the right thing to do is and doing it, you know, I don't know. I find it really difficult in this area. Obviously, I've quit a 19-year career. I've quit almost every addiction I've had. I know how to switch my life and change it and be different. I'm just, I really struggle in this area. Are you feeling a little tearful right, right now? Yeah. What's okay. coming up for you now, Lee? Like you're feeling this. Just, I just, <laughs> I just feel mis, misunderstood. I just, I just, I just, I just want everybody to. I want everybody to feel my pain. I want them to understand what it feels like, so they could be react differently. Because people say they understand and they don't understand. <laughs> you want people in your life to understand how hard you're working, how much you care about them. Is that? No, they, yeah. they can see how hard I'm working. What is it that they don't understand that you would want them to understand? Maybe they don't understand your pain and how much you're, you're hurting inside and how much you're giving, giving, giving and feeling kind of trapped and so it sounds like uh, the, the, there's nobody to kind of put their arms around you and, and, and give you some real uh, warmth and acceptance and, and love and, and to believe in you a little bit. I just, I just can't see how anybody can get divorced, see their child 50 times a year, maybe, maybe 50 to a hundred times a year, like, and that, and then they can just put that past them and say to themselves, I'm a good dad. Mm. And, and nowhere in that vision is there room for a good dad. That is not a good dad. And, and, and my ex-wife will always tell him that I'm a terrible dad. She will always... She will always been set up for failure, is that what you're saying? Like it feels like the conditions under which the divorce occurred. I can, and- I can honestly I can see I can honestly see her rationale. Like uh, we get divorced, guy gets a job, leaves the railway, gets a job when he travels around the world, can't leave that job now because if he does he can't feed his family. Right. Right. So now he's here and he's there and he's in Spain, he's in Monte Carlo, he's here, he's doing all these different jobs. Well, obviously he doesn't care about his kid, but that is not the case. Of course I care about my kid. People don't understand this, but I, I gave up my boy so I wouldn't have to break my ex-wife's heart. It's not I gave up my boy because I didn't want to be with my boy. He right. could live with me. I always wanted him to live with me. But then to be told like consistently that you're a bad father, and I know full well that that relationship and that mess is, 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 is found its way into my relationship now. Mm. I know that. I can see the transference. When, when, when me and Liza were together in the beginning, I'd be having a go about something, and she'd be like, what? what are you on about? Like I haven't even done anything and I knew it was coming from a different yeah. place, a different relationship. But you still feel a lot of um, guilt and uh, anger as well. I mean, for sure there's a lot of anger and frustration and resentment coming up for you, but also guilt because you care so much about your son because being a good dad is so important to you. And so you're saying that when Liza um, is critical of you, um, or even gives you a sideways glance or right something like that or asks you to do something that it triggers some of these feelings in you and it's it, yeah it, it 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 almost 
builds up the evidence that I'm not good enough in those two hugely yeah. critical departments for me. Like I have to be a good dad and I have to be a good husband. Why? Probably because my dad was none of them. And he's my main role model. I, I don't know. But, right. you know, I, I, took my, I took my boy. I didn't see him for six months because I was in America. I got a job in the Bahamas. Lucky me, right? So I said to my boy, I'm going to fly back to the UK. I'm going to pick you up. Me and you are going to have a wonderful time in the Bahamas for two weeks. But my wife then got really resentful of that. Because why, wasn't, why didn't I want the whole family to go? And I felt such crushing guilt for not being able to turn around and say, do you know what? I want to go on holiday with my boy on his own. Because my because if I go on holiday with my boy and my wife and my daughter, he's not my boy anymore. He's different. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? He, yeah. behaves, he behaves differently. He, 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 he conforms and fits right. into this new family that he never asked for. Right. But when he's just me and him, it's beautiful. It's just like, yeah, I need this moment. So then I come back and I'm like, I want more holidays like that. But then, of course, quite obviously, then my wife's going to say, well, when are we going to get a holiday? Well, now you're, now you're counting the pennies, right? Now it's like, well, sorry, I'm off from now. It's a, it sounds like it's more <clears throat> one of the most important things in the world to you is to be a good dad and a, a loving father and a, and, and a loving husband. But that, <clears throat> that, that uh, your wife and and your ex-wife uh, are, are always implying that 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 you're not good enough, and, and that that theme creates tremendous pain for you. Not only the sadness and the tears, but also and the and the guilt. But also, you might be feeling pretty angry, uh, uh, frustrated, uh, unappreciated, hopeless, and discouraged about things ever changing, and maybe even uh, on some level lonely. I feel like the loneliest person in the world. I feel completely misunderstood. I feel different to everybody. Nobody gets me. However, I will say my wife, I strongly believe, thinks I'm a fantastic husband and a fantastic father. I think my ex-wife thinks I'm nothing but a piece of shit on her shoe. Um, But my wife now, I think she thinks I'm a beautiful father and a beautiful, I really do believe that. Um, I'm dragging shit into that. Okay, so that was the empathy segment. Um, thank you for uh, brilliant work, uh, David and Jill. Um, I'm always amazed at uh, seeing how the two of you works. Just, uh, just, uh, just wonderful. And so, uh, unless you have any further comment, uh, we'll invite our listeners to join us uh, next time for the agenda setting segment. Thank you, Fabrice. Thank you. Okay, bye. This has been another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast. For more information, visit Dr. Burns' website at feelinggood.com where you will find the show notes for this podcast under the blog page and where you can leave your comments and questions. The website has an abundance of resources for therapists as well as non-therapists, including books, workshops, a list of online training groups around the world, and much more. Theme music is Gypsy Jazz in Paris, 1935, composed and performed by Brett Van Donzel. I am your host, Fabrice Nye, and I invite you to join us next time for another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast.